Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Hot Seat. My name is Jenny Waldron. I'll be your host. We're here with Wes Davis. And The Hot Seat is just this. It's an opportunity for us to see some live answers to tough questions from a pastor's heart. And so thank you, Wes, for being here tonight. Uh, we have a really interesting topic. And I know people have been really excited about this, asking lots of questions. But the topic is Jesus and the end of the world. And so I just <laughs> want to know, like, let's start off the bat. Why did you pick this topic? Okay, well, um, I, I picked the question because I noticed a lot of people were asking questions about what was happening in the world today and then how applied to some of the prophecies that we read in Revelation um, about the end of the world. And one of the things I noticed was this is um, there was some confusion. And uh, it's not really my style to speak on what I'd say is controversial subjects, but I noticed this is when there's some silence on an issue, a lot of times people are pulled in the direction of whatever the loudest vo voices are. Yeah. And so um, the loud polarizing voices of what's happening in our world today was almost in some ways pitting Christians against each other. Hmm. And so the pastor inside of me was like, I want to see people unified around Jesus and his mission. And I want to be able to speak to some of these tough questions in ways that um, we aren't really limited maybe by a sermon or a few minutes that yeah. are, you know, but to be able to speak at length longer and answer real questions. Um, the other thing I noticed is I believe this. I believe that American Christians are having trust issues right now with God. Um, and I actually, it makes sense why. I mean, we're coming out of a time that's been very unsettling, and uh, there's just so many unknowns. And one of the things that when you study, like, kids that grow up in volatile homes, they often grow up with trust issues that they have to work through to have healthy relationships. And so this isn't new. We've seen the people of God through Scripture kind of working through trust issues to actually deepen their trust in God and build healthier relationships with each other. And, and, and so I would say there's even like two things that I'll say that if I say this and part of you wonders if it's true, you might be wrestling with some trust issues with God. And the first thing I'd say is this, that God controls history. Doesn't mean that we don't have choices. Right. Doesn't mean that everything in the world that happens, God's for. Doesn't mean that at all. But it means that God ultimately is in control of history and God knows where this is all going. Hmm. The second is this, is that God is in charge of those who are in charge of me. That regardless of who the leaders and rulers are in this world, that there is actually a Lord of Lords and a King of Kings. And what that does is it brings a peace to my heart. It allows me to then work with what I believe Jesus is calling us to do as his people to bring his kingdom to this world. And my hope is by watching this, that you would actually be encouraged, that your trust would grow in God. And specifically, I know that there's Christians that are watching this, and I know that there's those who are curious. Maybe you're just, you're not sure where you are in your faith, but you're interested in a subject like this. Um, know this, I'm not trying to like write an apologetic uh, with yeah. this. I'm not, I haven't designed this like a debate. I really want to answer these things from a pastor's heart. It's one of the things that I actually love about the hot seat is you're not trying to say, hey, I'm the leading authority on these no. things. I'm the only person you should ever listen to. This is really your heart yeah. for the people that we're connected to here and your friends. And by the way, if you're watching this right now and you know that someone needs some encouragement, they need to hear some hope, uh, you know, you're like, I want to watch this with you. Share this video right now and they'll get to be a part of watching it as well. You can comment in the comments, uh, extra questions and conversation as it goes. There'll be somebody in there who can comment back to you. And here's how tonight's going to go. We have asked for your questions and you sent in a ton of questions, over a hundred questions on the topic of revelation, end times, the end of the world. How can we look for Jesus in that? And honestly, you, you gave amazing questions and I picked my 10 favorite. I say 10, Wes, but I actually kind of, I put a couple of them together. So I have some bonuses in okay. there. Hopefully All you guys right. are going to like that. Hope you're ready for it, Wes. Okay. And so the way tonight's going to go is I'm going to give you about five minutes okay. to frame up the conversation. This is five pastor minutes you decide but I mean I do have a microphone so I can cut you off <laughs> so five minutes to frame up the conversation and then I have 10 questions that you've written in I'm going to ask those on your behalf and we'll get to hear from your heart what it is that you have an answer for us on that okay so topic Jesus in the end of the world five minutes you're on the clock okay so when I think about Jesus in the end of the world I go right to a book in the Bible and it's called Revelation and so this is a book I've been reading um, a couple times over the last couple days, studying it over the last few weeks. And uh, it's a book that when I was a kid, it brought me a lot of fear. Hmm. I was always scared reading it. And now that kind of as an adult, it actually, for me, brings a lot of confidence and encouragement. Hmm. 
Because when you read the book of Revelation, you realize in the end there's a new heavens and a new earth and God himself living with his people in a world where there's no death, there's no dying, there's no pain, there's no tears. This is the world that you've always dreamed of. If you're somebody here that you don't know where you are with God, this is the, the world you've always dreamed of is right here in the book of Revelation and Jesus is the one that leads us there. Now, um, to frame up the conversation on Revelation, let's just start with the way that John frames the book of Revelation. Sounds great. Okay, so when you start off reading uh, the first few verses, okay, um, it says, this is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that must soon take place. Okay, so when, I, so when I'm reading this, again, I, I I actually believe that the Bible is not a book that's you know, like so hard to understand that you shouldn't be able to do it. It does take some work, but it should be, the, it's the obvious stuff. And so when I, when I look at the obvious stuff here, it says, this is a revelation. So what's a revelation? Okay. I notice this. First of all, the word revelation is singular, not plural. So not revelations, revelation. I, I, all the time people say, oh, I love the book of revelations. And I'm like, I, I don't correct them, but in my head, I'm like, there, it's well, just anyway, one. There's just one. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and the word revelation is, is the word where we get the word apocalypse, okay? Mm -hmm. So when we hear revelation or apocalypse, we're always like, oh, it's that thing that nobody can understand. But yet the word apocalypse or revelation means this. It's like God saying, I want you to understand what really hasn't been understood. Yeah. So it's a revealing, it's an unveiling. It's like, you see this here that you don't get and you don't understand. I want to, I, I want to like communicate with you guys what this is. Wow. Okay, so that's a revelation or apocalypse. Now, you'll notice that apocalypse is actually also a genre of writing. So when John writes this book, he says this is a revelation, he's also saying that this actually is a style of writing. So, for example, if you, um, in our world, you have fiction, nonfiction, sci-fi. I don't, you see Yeah, that? all kinds of fantasies, like Lord of the Rings. Oh, gosh. Bring all the Lord of the Rings. Okay, so, uh, so revelation is a style or a genre of writing. So all of the readers who got this would know, okay, I, we know what this is. This is a, a style of writing. And um, with it, it uses codes. And the codes are supposed to help people understand or unveil, really, what are the evils in the beastly powers of this world and what is the truth and the beauty of God. So now the codes for the readers, the readers who got this primarily had a Jewish mindset and they would have been very familiar, very well versed with the Old Testament. So 70% of the codes of Revelation all come from the Old Testament. They're primarily from the book of Daniel, uh, Ezekiel, a little bit from Joel, uh, Zechariah. Um, and um, you, 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 you read the Old Testament in more. They just, they're just, okay, that's what those are. Right. So, so when John in chapter one says there's a son of man, everyone who reads it knows, oh, Daniel talks about it, Ezekiel talks about it, and we know the son of man is Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, when you read about, like, for example, the lampstands, you're like, what are the lampstands? It's, the lampstands are the church. And you're like, well, how do you know they're the church? And I'm like, well, because this was a softball. <laughs> like, literally, it says in Revelation, guys, this, the lampstands are the church. But um, that would have been a code from, 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 from Zechariah, mm -hmm. okay? So these codes carry over, and the codes we're supposed to, one, is really help the reader understand it. But it also kind of does this. It's kind of like when Jesus told parables, in a lot of ways what he was doing is he was revealing truth to the hungry and hiding, hiding it from those who were self-righteous or arrogant. That's good. So the codes kind of do that. Is if, like, so it would, in some ways, in a persecuted time, this would be protecting the reader from those who would be wanting to hurt them, but then actually showing them the truth, what they needed to know about the confidence of the gospel winning. Yeah, so it's written to people who are, especially this one, on the underside of power. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, and then, so this is John. So who's John? John's a person in history. He's a pastor. And as we read, as we read, continue in chapter one, he's a pastor because he's writing to these seven churches in Asia Minor, okay? Turkey, okay? Uh, these churches are real churches, and he's a pastor of the pastors. So he's called a bishop. Yeah. And so he's been exiled to this island of Patmos, okay? So there's a level of persecution here where he has been put in a place to prevent him from spreading the gospel. So he writes this apocalypse to encourage the church. They, 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 they need this at this time. Mm -hmm. and, so, um, and, and so with this, uh, John, now which John is this? This is most likely, uh, tradition would say, the same John that wrote the gospel of John, who is also one of the 12 disciples. Now some would say, well, I don't know. Well, we do know his name's John. He's a pastor, and he's a pastor of pastors, okay? Now, so when we talk about a revelation, okay, so that's, I'm framing this up. This is a revelation where God's saying, I want to reveal truth to you. Actually, the whole Bible's a revelation. Did you know that? 
In a lot of ways, all of the Bible is actually seen here in the book of Revelation. It's an unveiling. And so when, um, the, the way you get taught this is um, there's a revelation that God says, okay, I'm showing you who I am. We would not know who God is without him revealing himself. Then what you have is people have to write down what God revealed. So he tells, the, the, the angel tells John, write this down. So he's like, all right, I should write this down. That's called transmission, yeah. where you write it down, you copy it, and you pass it on. At some point, somebody did that. They had a revelation. They wrote it down. They passed it on. Now, then what has to happen is what's called translation. So we go from revelation, transmission, to then translation. Somebody has to say, here's what it's like your language, because this wasn't written in English. Right. Okay. So this would have been in Greek, and so it would need to be translated. Okay. So um, from there, at some point, what we want to do is we want to apply it to our lives, but we have to do something that's called interpretation. When we do interpretation, this is where people get me messed up, I think. I think so too. They jump right to application and they misinterpret what it means because we start with ourselves. Okay, so here's Wes's four rules on interpretation, okay? So the first one is this. Let the Bible interpret the Bible. Codes. Son of man, Jesus. Lampstands, the church, okay? All right, so we're going to let the Bible interpret the Bible. Secondly is this. We also are going to do is we're going to do historical context. What did the people of that time think it meant? Yeah. So, okay, at that time, what's happening in that <clears throat> world historically, okay? Now, I would date Revelation about 90 um, AD, okay? Mm -hmm. Some would say 60, but I would say probably not. That would be under the reign of Nero. I think it, this largely is going to speak to Emperor Nero, Roman Empire, but I would say it's under the reign of Domitian. Okay. We have a question about that later too, so that'll be fun. Okay, so in the 90s, and then um, in my head, the, the, the way I would view it as this is, is um, uh, what, what would have happened around that time is you'd have had um, Nero with somebody in 54 who becomes the emperor, and then um, at 64, there's the great fire of Rome, mm -hmm. okay? And so from there, he, the Christians get blamed, right? then persecuted. So you have Peter crucified upside down because he thought it was too great of an honor to be crucified like his Lord. And then Paul gets beheaded. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then from 70 to 85, you have the Jewish councils where they basically go on and they say, hey, this Christian group isn't a part of us. And so the Christians are then exposed to more persecution. Okay. Mm -hmm. We'll probably have to talk about that later. Okay. And so what I'm showing you is there's historical context. Yeah. And so this is being written to a people that are being persecuted in a time where Rome is this empire and there's people on the underside of power being oppressed. So I say that the Bible interpret the Bible to historical context. The third is this is, is that is all of the scripture points to Jesus. That's John 5, 39. All, Jesus said, you search the scriptures because in them you think they find life, but all the scriptures point to me. So whenever, in fact, I've had people say, Wes, you're teaching on this and you always seem to bring it back to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I'm a Christian, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, in any part of scripture, the whole story. If you try to apply scripture without pointing it to Jesus, you're going to do some things not meant for you. And some of them are going to be weird. It's really good. Okay. So, um, and then the last thing I do is this, is I read it in community. There is no one person that has like all of the inside tract on truth. Mm -hmm. Not me, not anybody else. That's how you'd end up with a cult. I love when you talk about this, that really when we're reading scripture, we're interpreting scripture for us to do it with people who might even like not look like me, maybe have a different life experience than I do, uh, a different background, because it does, it adds richness to the way that we understand what the scriptures are saying. Every time I read, I learn something more. So that's, that's how I frame it up. Okay. Is what we want to do is this is we want to, at some time we want to get all the way to application, but to do that, we have to actually do the hard, the, the, it's obvious, but it is hard work of, of interpreting. What did this mean to the people then? What does it say about Jesus? What is God saying to the community of believers today that I can live it out? Okay. Well, and honestly, that's what we're doing, I think, together here, that we're asking questions of the scriptures and we're doing that together in community. And so, so I think good. this is interpretive work. All it's right, really let's good. Do it. Can you do this before we jump into the questions? Because they're yeah. really, really good. Yeah. Would you just give an overview of the revelation for people who might okay. not be as familiar with the text? Just give okay, us a sure. big picture of the story in two minutes. Okay. All right. One, John, Pastor John, has an encounter. A revelation is it from Jesus and of Jesus. That word, some of your Bibles say from, say of. That means it's Jesus is both the source and the subject of the revelation. Okay? All right, so John has it. He's told to write it down. He sends it to seven churches. The seven churches, literally, if you follow it, is a mail route. That's cool. Yeah, it's like a postal route. 
and it kind of moves in a triangle. And so uh, he sent, and what you see is that all the churches have something wrong with it. They hear something they do well, here's something they don't. Isn't that like churches today? <laughs> but what's happening is God, what he's doing is he's writing this to prepare them so that they will be a part. God wants the church to join him in his mission. That's good. Okay. In chapter four, he gets invited to come up here. This is the, where he has the revelation of what? There's a throne room and on the throne. So it'd been a throne room, just like a Roman one. Yeah. But on, on the throne isn't the emperor. It actually is the lamb, which code wise we would know is Jesus. You're like, where, well, the Bible's G, look, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Okay. Whole thing there on the symbolism of the lamb of God, Jesus sacrificial love. Okay. So we have that in four and five at the end of five, then there's this scroll that's brought out. Now the scroll is like, this is like the whole human story. This is like, why is this happening to me? How come there's human suffering? What's the meaning and purpose in life? And the person gets sad because like, no one can open the scroll. Who can open the scroll? There's no one. Going. Oh, and the lamb is the only one where Jesus is the only one that brings meaning and purpose mm -hmm. to our lives and our sufferings. That's good. From there, it's just real quickly. He does three. There's three things that happen as Jesus opens the scrolls. The way. So if you have a box from Amazon, you have to unbox it, right? Yeah, for sure. Which the, I mean, let's be honest. I have a lot of boxes from Amazon right now. <laughs> okay. So there's packing tape, right? Yeah, for okay. Sure. For them, they would take a letter and they would seal it. Mm -hmm. And so it'd have to be unsealed. It was a way of protecting the information. So Jesus then opens the letter with what the scroll and there's seven seals. Okay. We'll talk about what those are later. Okay. So seven seals, the seventh seal will then, oh, this is all the tribulation mm -hmm. will open up the seven trumpets. Yeah. So the seventh seal now is, is that like Harry Potter or something? I don't know. I don't watch <laughs> that stuff. Um, I mean, there's seven books. <laughs> oh gosh. And so then you have the seven, seven trumpets. Okay. And then yet there's a, then you have the seven bowls. Okay, there's a conflict in between. So we, we have Jesus opening up the story of what's happening in humanity, going right to seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. It leads to a final battle and a last judgment, a new heavens and a new earth, and everybody living with God. That's revelation. That's revelation. Okay, are you all ready? I hope that you are. Maybe that gave you a new lens, a way to frame up the conversation that we're looking at. Jesus is in power. He's sitting on the throne. And this is how we're going to approach the revelation where this we're doing interpretive work together. So uh, with that, I feel like we should just jump into questions. Are you yeah, ready for this? Yeah, I th well, we'll find out. <laughs> well, here's the deal. I didn't want to start you off easy. Serious? I didn't. I, you know, I could have thrown you a softball, but I feel like uh, I would be doing the people a disservice. And so the first question comes from Matt, and he asks, how much of Revelation is end times prophecy, and how much was early church persecution under Nero in Rome? Okay. 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 So, yeah, so I started to go there, so I should go back, huh? Well, tell us a little bit. Like, so you started with the dating, and you mentioned Nero. You mentioned Domitian. Okay. And then you also talked a little bit about the, you know, when it is. And I think that might help us. But you also, I think, how are we approaching this? Is it prophecy? How much is prophecy? How much is history? That helps in our interpretive work. Okay. So one of the things you'll find um, is depending on, on what teaching you've sat under, there's, I would say there's more than this, but there's five primary ways that people read the book of Revelation. Yeah. Okay. And so somebody gets the book of Revelation and you've probably sat under a pastor that has a certain view. I have a certain view. Yeah. Okay. I, I mean, we all do. Me okay. too. All right. So one of the views, so I'll give you five. The first one's called the futurist. So if you're a futurist, you think this most of revelation happens in the future. You see prophecy is predictive. And so when you're asking questions about revelation, you're always thinking, okay, this is going to happen probably in my lifetime. It's happening in the future. Most of this is something that happens later. Yeah. Okay. Then there's what's called secondly is the view is called a preterist. And that's where you believe that most of the revelation happened in the past. Okay. So let me speak to that. So I mentioned, okay, this was a church that I believe was in the nineties. Okay. Um, and there, uh, there, there, there is some level of persecution. And you'd say under Domitian. And John has uh, been exiled to uh, Patmos. Mm -hmm. And um, this is preparing the people of God for what's going to happen. Yeah. And uh, if you look at timelines, uh, there's a, there's that Jerusalem councils that happened between 70 and 85. And that's important because it was in those councils that the, they're saying like, you know, those Christian people, they're saying this to the Romans. They're not on our team. They're not a part of us. Right. And the reason why is Jews ha were grandfathered and had what was called religious licensing laws, um, where they could practice their religion without being uh, persecuted by Rome. 
They were allowed to do it. Of course, Rome got some money for it, but anyways. Just a couple taxes. So Rome, Rome was polytheistic. They don't care who you worship, but you did have to give your allegiance to the empire. There's actually what was called emperor worship. Well, yeah, basically they said you could worship whoever you want to worship as long as you also worship the emperor. And, and with that, saying Caesar is Lord. So you can see Christians didn't want to say Caesar's Lord. They, there's Jesus is Lord. Which is kind of subversive now that you think about it. Jesus uh, is Lord. Yeah. That feels like indirect response. Unbelievable. To the idea of Caesar yeah, is unbelievable. Lord. So they wouldn't say it. And so, and, and previously they'd been kind of protected as because they were seen as well. Jesus was Jewish. Disciples were Jewish. This is a sect of Judaism. It was during that time frame that were clearly said that they weren't, that they started to experience a lot more persecution. Okay, this is going to go all the way to in, in 135, you have the complete destruction of the temple, Jerusalem, and the end of the revolt. And so in a lot of ways, when you read in Matthew 24, where Jesus says this generation will not pass before this happens, yeah. that stuff all happens in their lifetime. So a preterist would say, hey, this all happened for the most part, except for maybe the last few chapters. Right. Okay. So we have futurist, preterist, then you have what's called continuous history. Continuous history would believe this. John's living over here, okay? So the, the continuous history is it's not all in the future. It's not all in the past. John's here, and the revelation is the entire story of history. Okay. Okay, so I, I actually, I think I was even taught as a kid that this church is this age, and this church is that age. This is the Middle yeah, Ages. Yeah, I have heard that before. Yeah, the Catholic Church's corruption was here. The Reformation's here. And so you're trying to use the all of Revelation as a continuous history timeline. Okay. Okay. The fourth view... Uh, would be called um, a, a symbolic view. Mm -hmm. And that's where you're viewing this as an epic struggle of good and evil and how it is that we're to live in every era. And it's strictly spiritual at that point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it's no specific part of history, but it applies to all because it's symbolic. Okay. okay? And then the, the last would be called the blended view. And the blended view would say this, that, that yes, this happened, the revelation happened for those early Christians in that world that the uh, empire that was beastly was Rome um, and uh, that, that the, the Christians being called to be faithful witnesses were having to live out the mission under persecution and that all happened in their lifetime. Uh, but the, 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 the blended person would also say this is also symbolic. So it's not only what was, but it continues to happen throughout history and it's going to come to full realization in the future. So they, the blended view would be really said in the way you see it in there in the Revelation, what was, what is, and what is to come. Mm -hmm. And I probably gave away what I think there. So Revelation <laughs> chapter 1, verse 8 is where I, that comes I, from. I view it as a blended view, yeah. Okay. So uh, hopefully that answers your question, Matt. I think it, that gives us a good understanding. And maybe I don't know where it is that you land, but I think one of the greatest parts about this is that mm -hmm. you kind of get to decide as you're listening to the Spirit and figuring out what it is that we're being invited into. We're all being invited to come up here, right? Chapter 4. Okay, so let's go to the next question. Okay. Uh, I decided that I would ask the most asked question next. I could have been mean and like saved it for the end, but I really wanted to get it out there on the table so those of you who have been holding your breath here it comes. Brett and many others asked the question, rapture, is it a thing? Okay, so uh, very, it's probably a very popular American question. Okay. Um, well, let's start with this. Okay, so the word rapture is in the book of Revelation how many times? Zero times. Okay, so zero. Right. Okay, right around zero. Okay. Right. Approximately not at all. Okay. So then it's like, well, where does it come from? Okay. So the concept of revelation or uh, the concept of rapture is in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and the main place people go to, and if you can pull out your Bible, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and um, verses 15 through 17. Okay. Now, now you can, I think, read the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54, and also read it in Philippians chapter three, verse 20. But this would be the place where I think it's the, just the clearest. Okay. And so can you read 15 through 17? Sure. Uh, so this is first Thessalonians chapter four. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep for the Lord himself will come down from heaven and with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And verse 18 says, therefore encourage one another with these words. Okay. 
So, so I don't know if you noticed, she read that there's two words there she read where we get actually the word rapture. Yeah. And so it's the words caught up. So here's the Lord coming, right, uh, with a mighty shout. Um, you have then uh, the dead in Christ rising, and you have the people of God who are caught up, and we meet with him in the air. Okay. So the word caught up is where we get the word rapture. Okay. It, it also is connected because I had you read it that passage because it's so the rapture is connected to his what? His coming. His coming. So the word the word rapture is the word hapazo, and the word um, coming is the word parousia. Um, and so they're connected. And let me explain it this way. So everything in their culture, you're like, well, let's get in their head. Like, what do they think? Because remember, we're doing the hard work. Right. Right. It's obvious. We're doing the hard work. But we got to do the hard work. And so, okay, so in their mind, what did that look like? Okay. Well, um, in, in that culture, if there was a war and there was a victorious general and he was returning home, okay, the people would start to hear word. Messengers would have been sent out in front and there would be like a trumpet. <laughs> There'd be a sound. There would be like, okay. And um, the people wouldn't wait for the victorious general to get all the way there. Yeah, too excited. They would run outside the city. Uh, in the same way, an emperor who might be visiting one of their colonies, that is maybe on the far edges of the Roman Empire, maybe a place like Philippi. Uh, as, they, as they near the city, the people would rush out. Okay? And it kind of reminded me, I was in Burkina Faso, and we were visiting uh, in Burkina a school that we had kind of helped fund. We were part of, we were that, on that trip going to bring some... Uh, um, drill some wells, right? Yeah, we we're going to drill some wells. Yeah. 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 And as we got there, the, the kids were so excited that they actually rushed out and they created this really like a parade, the longest line you've ever seen, right? It's like longer than even Disneyland, okay? And uh, we would walk through and the kids were clapping and shouting and as you were being ushered in. I think you even get a picture of it with the triumphal entry as Jesus is going to come into Jerusalem as the Messiah. The people kind of rush outside the city. They're throwing down the palm leaves and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, yeah. blessed is he. So that is the picture they would have of a, of a coming all right, Perusia, and then people being caught up. Yeah, I, I remember when the Seahawks won the Super Bowl. Uh, we, we uh, people living here in Kitsap, we were trying to take a ferry across, and I had to wait like four of them, okay, because so many people were caught up, mm -hmm. swept up. In fact, as the people would run out, the dust clouds would really they would almost say that they're coming in the clouds, yeah, okay. Now, uh, the Jewish mindset would have had also some of these other images of Moses coming down off the mountain. And uh, I wonder what the people of Israel have been doing while I've been seeking God. Oh, they're making idols. Okay. So, uh, and you can see some of that similarity. Because the mountain what, was covered in the cloud and he's coming down. And he's from coming the down. Yeah. yeah. And so these are connected thoughts. Okay. So now there are those who would believe that the, this, this caught up is a physical Okay. In fact, there's different viewpoints on this. And I don't know if we're going to dive into it. Some would say oh, that there's a, a seven. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, I'll wait for that then. <laughs> so the, the physical being caught up is one. Okay. Some would say, okay, it happens. It happens. We're caught up. And then there's a period of testing and then the Lord comes back. Okay. Then there's like, no, we only go through half the testing. And then there's the view of, okay, actually we're caught up and he comes back and it happens either like one, two or simultaneously. Okay. Um, the thing that I look at is this. I, you know, so one thing, I don't have a strong view on this, so I'll start there. That's good. Okay. So I just I have to be honest about it. Uh, the strong view I have is this. Most American Christians that I know are hyper-focused on how we get out of here. And the revelation is how heaven comes here. Hmm. In fact, I, can I personalize this? Sure. In a pandemic, um, there could be times where God is calling your family or yourself to move or go somewhere else. Absolutely. Okay. But I do find it interesting. I think there's a bit of what I would just call escape theology. Hmm. Okay. How do we get out of here? And so I think um, uh, that's a concern. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and can I, do, you, do you mind? Can I jump into this a little uh, more? Please do. Because I think this is great. Okay. So, um, okay. Rapture theology as we know it, where we're physically caught up. Okay. How long of a theology? So for how many years have that been taught? About 200. Right, it's not. So this is not a view that's been taught through, no. Not in the early church. The primary view was how heaven came here, not how we leave earth. Okay, okay. so where'd it come from? 
Uh, well, I think the father it would be John Darby, and you can read stuff on him. It was popularized though, a little bit more is a book got written called Jesus is Coming about 15 years after the Civil War. And um, by the way, you'll notice that the, the, the I'd say kind of the um, hyper focus on Christians leaving earth tends to be around tough times. Wow. Put it around a war. In fact, I would, in fact, if you want to know when it really, to me, took off in America was during the Great Depression. And you can see even some of the early uh, denominations and groups that believed in this type of thinking, it really swelled during the 30s. Mm. And also there was something else that came out at that time called Monopoly. Interesting. Uh, so Monopoly, when it was first put out as a board game, was actually to show the ills or evils of capitalism. Of course, it got modified a little bit, which, I mean, it's one of my favorite games. I mean, um, who doesn't want to bankrupt your family for a game? <laughs> but think about this. So during the, I, it's a price Parker Brothers that it took off, but it was a cheap way for your family to have fun times over and over. And what they found is this, in a time where people in the Great Depression were losing everything, there was a sense of control they had over their lives by gaining some things. Wow. And I wonder if our desire to be raptured away is because of the lack of control we feel in our world. And while we're praying for God to take us, there's a group of people that I believe are saying, God, don't take us, send us. Wow. Wow. And I think, you know, you mentioned that there's, there's this idea that what we think about these things really does affect our lives. Well, I, the, 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 the wordy way to say it is your eschatology informs your worldview so eschatology is your theology of the end things or the last things yeah it's how you see it so how you see the last things really it, it really shapes how you think you should live it because if i'm trying to get out of here i don't care about this world but mm -hmm. if i think heaven's coming here it totally changes things it changes how i treat you mm -hmm. think about it. if i if i'm trying to get out of here from all you evil people right that's very different than i feel like god's coming here to heal you wow and so I, I think that what, what John is doing in chapters two and three is getting a church ready to go on a mission. And there's no way for them to do this until they go four and five where they're invited in this open door to see Jesus in power sitting on the throne. And without his power, we can't do his mission in this world because we're going to face a lot of tough stuff. Hmm. So, uh, so that's my answer so on that. So there's some thoughts on that. Well, you're not off the hook yet, Wes, because I know people did ask, what is the rapture? And, and you know, what yeah. are your views on it? But there's also a lot of questions about when, because as you explained through the book of Revelation, there are these, this, you know, the different series of sevens that people often will call the tribulation. And so people have a question about if, if there is a physical rapture or whatever that looks like, when might it be? Okay, well, uh, well let and me And this say is a this. question, by the way, a lot of people, Haley, Dan, Diane, Katie, thank you for sending in your question. I was, eight, I was 18 years old. I was uh, um, 17, 18. I was, I was a junior, going to be a senior. And that year, a guy wrote a book. He was a, a, a NASA, NASA guy, worked for NASA. And he, he wrote a book on 88 reasons why Jesus is coming in 1988. And at that age, I was like, because I was thinking about the stuff in my life. I'd had so many dreams where I got left behind. Okay. All right. I had so many. I mean, like, honestly, if I came home, no one was there. I called grandma and she was gone. Yeah. If they didn't answer the phone, you're like, it happened. It happened. It, <laughs> it happened. happened. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had a dream one time where we were going to Cheney Stadium to, to make it to the rapture in a hot balloon. And my grandma had to get cough drops. And I went into the store and I couldn't find them. And I got, anyways, that's... I just, the fact that you're going to attend the rapture in a hot air balloon. Was that Cheney Stadium? But you Stadium? needed cough drops. I just... Well, she had a cough. In heaven. She always that had cough, a cough. That, she maybe missed the whole like no sickness thing in heaven. So, okay. So that year, I remember it was December 31st, 1988. And we're having a candlelight vigil. And I remember just thinking, this is Jesus' last chance to come back in 1988. And I didn't think it was going to happen, but I was like, and I, want, and I was so concerned, like, like I could be left, okay? Now, it didn't happen, and the guy wrote a book the next year called 89 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming in 1989. He would follow it up with a book on 93 Reasons, 94 Reasons, and 97 Reasons. And people bought them. Like, they continued to purchase the books. Well, 97 didn't sell. Okay. Yeah. Well, At I mean, then, point, but then Y2K came around. So, I mean, I'm a little younger than you and oh we had the same experience. Y2K. I mean, you know, we're having a vigil waiting for midnight. Everything's mm -hmm. going to reset and Jesus is going to come back. Uh, the, the thing that we know, the primary teaching of scripture is, is that heaven's coming here mm -hmm. and that we have to prepare. There clearly is in revelation tribulation. Yeah. Okay. There's, there's seven years that are going to be very difficult. Okay. And during that time, the, the people who take views on, on, on the rapture, they would have one of three primary views. 
is called pre-trib, tribulation, pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib. Right. So pre-trib, that's the one you hope for if you have this viewpoint of physical, we're leaving here, and we miss all the hard stuff. Okay. And if you believe, and people who read that in the revelation will tend to think that's chapter four. I don't think that's chapter four. I think four is the open door. Like to the, com- a, the come up here is what they would I think that's that. an invitation to a life of worship and being sent out in power to live on mission. That's how I read it. Mm-hmm. That's why I think the people read it in that day. You know, you're living on earth. It looks like that, like someone else is in control. Oh wait, in worship, I realized, no. Okay. Jesus is in control. Okay. Um, now there's a mid trip view that you kind of go through what would be like you you do the seals and the trumpets and miss the bowls, okay? Now, with that viewpoint, you might stick it, you know, in between. So like maybe chapter 14 would be a place that's between uh, the, the, the trumpets and the bowls. And then there's people who have like a post view. That would have to be, you'd have to go all the way to 19 yeah. at that point, okay? So, uh, but um, the, the, the point of scripture though is this, Jenny. In every parable that Jesus told about him coming back, the point was this live ready. Yeah. Like there's a, there's a way of living, anticipating, not that we leave, but that heaven comes here. And then we actually are a part of that. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe we're physically, maybe it's spiritually, maybe it's maybe people, maybe, I don't know, maybe you're killed. Maybe the Christians are killed and then their spirit. I don't, I don't know how that all plays out, but I do know I want to be a part of it. And the reason why I know that is Jesus taught us to pray your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Okay. Uh, I feel like you did a good job on that one. So thank you for, uh, thank you for your attention. It was a big question. Oh, I, but by the way, if someone says they know the date, they don't. Jesus said no one knows. They don't. So, so, so you're saying I shouldn't write 20, 2021 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 2021 because well, I was thinking about a book deal. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Let's move sell. on. All right. Uh, this sell. is a great question from Andrew. I want to shift it a okay. little bit. And, and this one, I think she gets really real. So of all the crazy things that have happened in our world during my lifetime, which of those were actually specific, significant signs of the end times? Okay. Other than Y2K? I mean, Y2K, let's just be (laughs) honest. That year, that was a year. Of all the crazy stuff. Well, okay. So, okay. Well, let me start with this is there are signs. Okay. So we'll start with is that's the reason why we're told about the the seals, the trumpets, and the bowls. I don't know if you have a Bible there or you have something to read or something, but um, in there, the, 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 the first four seals are what's known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah. Okay? And so there's four horses. There's a white horse, a red horse, a black horse, and a pale horse. Mm-hmm. Okay? So the, the white horse is actually this political and military power. It's like lust for power. And it's interesting because you see a white horse, you're like, that must be Jesus. It's not. It's like a false power. It's a false leader. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Because we know the, the, the rider on the white horse whose name is Faithful and True, that's later. And he's got some blood on him. Okay. Um, the second is that um, red horse, and that is widespread violence in false peace. Okay. Hmm. Okay. This, um, the third horse there is a black horse, and that's the horse that is what's called the social and economic dysfunction. That's really where we have the social classes wars against each other. When we've taught, when we taught on Revelation before, which by the way, you can look at a whole series we did on Jesus and power. It's on the New Life YouTube page. One of the things you talked about here was this is a lot of what the Old Testament prophets would speak against. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's the rich taking advantage of the poor, honestly. Right. Okay. And then the fourth uh, is that pale horse, and that's actually sickness and plagues. Okay, so now I want you to think about that. Okay. Doesn't that sound like the world we live in today? What I'm saying is these, these are the common evils of humanity. There's a lot of generations that's seen these four horses. Hmm. But what's the fifth one there? And that's why I wanted you to open. Did you see the it's fifth? Persecution. It's the souls the that are slain. So yeah. if somebody said, what's a sign that we're living in end the times? Martyrs. I actually think it's the number of people who are persecuted in our world today. Open Doors is a ministry that studies persecution in the world of Christians. And I was trying, there are more Christians in the world under severe persecution than any other time in human history. 260 million Christians a day. That's amazing. That's crazy. Yeah. So you say, what's a sign? I'd say that's a sign. Yeah. That's a sign. Um, you, 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 you move into uh, the next section there of the trumpets, and you see there this is the shared suffering. And then we'll, we'll move into the bowls. And with the bowls, you see what's one of the you, you see in between there you this great conflict. Yeah. And with there, you, you see there's a dragon, there's a beast, there's a mark of the beast. 
And so you see, is that a sign? Okay. What's interesting, we look at these different signs. I think that the persecuted Christians is a big sign. But the biggest sign I think is this. Jesus said his gospel would go to the ends of the earth and then the end will come. I think the number one sign of, of, of the end is that God wants his people to know his love. And it would be the gospel getting to everybody. Every unreached people group, every person would have a chance in their heart language to hear the gospel in a way that sounds like good news. That's the number one sign in my mind. Wow. Uh, one of the things I love when, when we think about, if, if we're approaching this from a blended view, which I know people are kind of considering where it is, and there's this idea of was and is and is to come, I think it's interesting when you look at like lust for power, widespread violence, economic and social dysfunction, sickness and tragedy, we've seen these repeat over history. Yeah. So I think that's interesting to think that there's this beautiful sign of hope that Jesus is pointing to of people experiencing him even within all of that brokenness. Mm -hmm. I do think that's really, really beautiful. You've talked at times that Jesus pointed to one very specific sign. When people asked him to give them a sign, the one that he pointed to. Well, I he think said, really yeah, valuable. he said, you guys want signs. He yeah. said, the only sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah. And you're like, uh, okay, explain that. <laughs> and he said, you know, as Jonah was in the belly of a whale, three days, three nights, so the son of man. And really what he was saying is this is the cross. The cross is the sign. And I think it, one that shows us is the way of Jesus is actually self-sacrificial love. Yeah. And also the message of the cross, the power of the cross, that's the sign that God gives us. Yeah. And, and it says that, that we will overcome by the word of their testimony, the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, that as people start to say, this is what Jesus has done in my life, and that message goes out all throughout the world, it'll be a great harvest. Ex especially when it's difficult. Like now is like, if you like, like now is the moment when it's difficult for God's people to live out his self, self sacrificial love and announce the good news pointing to the cross and sharing their testimony. Wow. Okay. Hey, you know, in addition to some of the questions that you sent in, there were some teenagers and young adults that also oh. sent in questions. Okay. And one of the ones that you started to mention, but I'm, I'm glad you didn't go too far into it because I want to okay. make sure that we hear from Grant Salvi from Clahouya Secondary School asks a great question that I think we're going to want to spend some time answering. Do you think the Antichrist has already been born and how are we supposed to know who he is and recognize him? Okay. Well, first, yeah, first of all, let me say, I know Grant. And what a great question that yeah. he asked. It's actually probably the question that I've, I've had over the years. Well, and there was another person who asked a similar question, Grant Kimberly, who said, well, we recognize the dragon and the beast. So there's dragon, beast, antichrist, mark of the beast. Oh, I got to say, first of all, <laughs> pray for Grant. The Packers lost today. And I know that's a tough one for you. But they went further than the Seahawks, right? I guess that's true. Which, by okay. the way, go Hawks. Yeah. 2022. I, I was always concerned that I could accidentally take the mark of the beast. Oh, yeah. I yeah. mean, I think that was something that I had a fear of okay. when I was a kid. Okay, so Grant asked, will we recognize the Antichrist? Like, if he's alive yeah, like, today. Has he already been born? How do we know? Okay, all right. Yeah, how will we okay. recognize? So for the readers, okay, we'll start with this. The word Antichrist is in the book of Revelation how many times? Also zero. Okay, so none. Yeah, <laughs> none. It's in First John. And actually, it's, you see the word Antichrist and also capital A Antichrist. Okay. All right. Little and big. In spirit of the Antichrist. Okay. So part of it is our misunderstanding of what the word means. It doesn't mean against Christ. Forever, I was like, yeah, you know, it's the ones that are against Christ. They're just like so obviously like, oh, it actually means it's the Greek prefix anti, which means instead of or in place of Christ. It's actually all substitutes for Christ. It's the ones that we give our allegiance, our worship to. That's not Jesus. Anybody that we adore, like, give our ultimate devotion and sacrifice to that's not Jesus, that is a lowercase antichrist. And there's been a lot of examples in history. I mean, I think you look at like a person like Hitler who um, turned people against each other to, to really to, to lift up his own power. And you say that was the spirit of the antichrist. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for the people living here, they would have said that that person is Nero. He was the evil of most evil of evil in their mind. So the mark of the beast is the number six six six. Okay, so uh, um, so like or in, a six one six in Latin, which also has some things in there. Well, numbers. Okay, um, in our culture we have letters and numbers. Many other cultures they're the same. Yeah. Well, I mean, like you ever heard of Roman numerals? Yes. So the no, Roman number for ten is X five. A V? I don't remember. Did I get that right? I think 50? I got it right. <laughs> okay. XV? Right. Okay. <laughs> so, it. okay. So, um, it's the same in Hebrew. Hmm. Okay. So, if you took the name Caesar Nero in Hebrew, 
Air, air mate. It's the number 666. Because the letters correspond. Yeah, correspond and if to you're numbers. like, well, no, we did it in Greek. That's why they said six one six. Yeah. So they are clearly referencing mm-hmm. Nero. Well, and it says this that the the, the number is a name. It, it even says the that number in the is a name, and yeah. it's placed where? It's placed on the hand and on the forehead. Hand and forehead. Okay. What? What? Okay. So you're Jewish. You know this. You know the Bible. What was supposed to go on your hand and your forehead? The Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. That way he says, these commands I give you today are being upon your heart. Teach them to your kids. Tie them where? Put them, on your, your do- put them on your forehead, your, your yeah. arm. So, like, stick that. That was to mark you. So, so, and really, really, it's really interesting is to mark us as what? The image of God. Hmm. Okay, so can you accidentally take the mark of the beast? Okay, now again, it's used in that culture, control. It's used for the only way you can buy or sell. You see, we, we, we are definitely living in a time where you can see a one world money system, a one world religion. Where I mean, think about, here's signs I see. One is this, we're living in a time where you can actually uh, um, control information, disinformation, um, you can, propaganda at a time, in no other time like now, okay? Mm-hmm. And so um, you can see deception, okay? Here's something I've noticed, okay? Everyone I've talked to that uses the word deception is only concerned about other people that are being deceived. Oh, Pastor, if you talk about all those deceived people. Okay, I hear the Antichrist or the, 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 the beast with the frog jumping out of his mouth, they're deceiving us. Yeah. Like, you get what I'm saying? Like, 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 isn't that the deception that you think everybody else is deceived and then you turn and you fight and war against each other? Hmm. That's the devil. It's divi- the, it's division that comes from the dragon. Yeah. Okay. That, if you look at the great conflict in 12 through 14, you have a dragon. That's the devil. There's this woman. Okay. That's Israel or the people of God. There's this child. That's the Messiah. Okay. The d- dragon wants to what? Kill that Messiah. The Messiah is going to lay down his life to give us life. You have what? You have the, the dragon and then you have two beasts. One beast is it's going to be political. The other one's going to be religious. One world government, one world religion. And the three of them make up the evil trinity. And okay, wait, t- slow down on that for one second. The evil trinity. So this is like yeah. the inverse of God. Yeah, and, and so we we're to take our stand. When people say, well, you know, okay, th- this is where, okay, God's people, instead of giving themselves their allegiance to this world, we give our allegiance to Jesus. We give our allegiance to the Lamb and to the ways of Jesus, hmm. okay? Uh, I don't know if that's something I should talk about now or later, but um, so... Uh, if Grant's wondering, is the Antichrist alive? The spirit of the Antichrist has been alive for 2,000 years. Yeah. There's been all kinds of substitutes of God. Hmm. Okay, is there going to be a time with a capital A uh, uh, Antichrist Beast. that's going to be in the two beasts? Dragon, yeah. yeah, could they be alive now? I don't know. Right. Okay, but I do know that you, you, they will call for your allegiance. And if I'm speaking to Grant and his generation, this world wants your devotion, your allegiance, your sacrifice, your time, the, your soul. And here's how, here's how you battle against that. If you give your soul to Jesus, no one, listen, no one can take your worship. You can only give it. It's good. So, so you wouldn't accidentally, they'd be calling for your worship. And so you would know if you were doing it. At okay. that point, okay? Okay, so dragon, beast, mark of the beast. It's about worship. It's about allegiance. I think those are some great answers. Thank you guys for those questions. I want to shift it just a little bit because there's some imagery that shows up, and we've talked a little bit about codes. And the next question, I think it has something to do with one of the codes. Okay. And so uh, Cody asks this, what is with the 144,000? And there's a, a follow-up question in here that someone else asked, which is what role does Israel play in all of this? Yeah, well, well, I'll see how I do. Um, we'll start with this, 144,000. Yeah. Okay, there is, um, so there is a group of people that might teach the 144,000 are the number of the real Christians that go to heaven and everybody else doesn't make it. Right. There so is there's only 144. So once you get to that number, that's it. Okay, so, okay, so do I believe that? No. Um, some would, if you read the left behind series, okay, which has a, listen, I read all of the red left behind series and the left behind junior, because I was a child of the 90s. Okay. 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 So that very, very very clearly would be a pre-trib pre-millennial rapture viewpoint. Um, and in a certain way of looking at things. Okay. All right. Now, um, 
in that, the 144,000, I think that they're the, the, the Jewish Messianic Christians who missed the rapture, who are now, you know, living. But then they realize that they missed Jesus. Okay. Yeah. okay. So when I read this, I don't read either one of those. Okay. What I'm reading, the 140, so if you look at the number 12, there's 12 tribes in the Old Testament. There's 12 disciples. When I see 140, 12 times 12. I mean, literally, this is, this is the people of God. That, and, and you see at one point, they're surrounding the lamb on Mount Zion. Mm -hmm. okay, I, I actually would believe this is the weekly gathering of God's people. Okay, And remember, this revelation happens when? On the, on the Lord's, Lord's, Day. Lord's Day. And we think that's Jesus. Actually, the Lord's Day in Rome was what? Set. That was, that, that was, no, that was Caesar's Day. Caesar's Day, that's right. Caesar's Day. And, and so then, these scrappy Christians on Caesar's so, Day. So Caesar is Lord, Jesus is Lord. They Lord's would Day, gather, no, this is Jesus' Day. Do you, see how, do you see how subversive it was? I like the it. The scrappy followers of Jesus would get together on Caesar's Day to announce Jesus is Lord. I mean, I, every time you come to a gathering anywhere, whether it's just a 10 people or a thousand people, you're joining all of the followers of Jesus throughout history and the world today and all of heaven around Jesus. And the 144,000, in my opinion, are this. They're the followers of Jesus who are white hot in their worship of God and wanting to live out his mission in this beastly world. They're not the ones trying to escape. They're the ones who are saying, Jesus, send us. We want to spread your word. And we see what happens happens right after a great harvest yeah that fires me up fires you up I, I i think it's literally people becoming the church on the mission with jesus to help heal the world that's what i think it is okay do you want to talk at all about israel yeah okay well one is this is i've always been fascinated in 1948 israel became a nation again and so many people who are dispensationalists who see the world happen in these different dispensations okay uh, they, would, they would say that's a sign of end times because God promised in the prophets, the Old Testament, that he'd reunite his people and bring them back, and now they're a nation. And, and, and I, I think it's pretty fascinating. I think it's amazing. I mean, think about it. It's like 2,500 years what they're a not story. a nation. Yeah, what a so story. So I 100% think that Israel has a unique part of God's story. There's what's called, have you heard of replacement theology? Yeah. Um, so it's where you would just take Israel and... Wherever you see it, you just replace it with the word church. Right. So like now I'm the children of Israel. The church is the children of Israel. Anytime I hear like God's chosen people, I assume that's me. Yeah. And so I'm not somebody who believes that. I actually believe that the Gentiles or, or the Christians, okay, are grafted into the story. But still Israel would have a unique part to their story. Now, their unique part to the story is what? It goes back to Abram, Abraham. Through, God says, I'm going to bless you. And he says, what after that? Through you, all nations, nations will be blessed. It's good. Okay. So, God, and by the way, I think there's a message for America. Hmm. God's blessing are on what? The people who will bless others. When we at some point decide that we're not going to bless others, but bless ourselves, we lose God's blessing in our life. Hmm. So, but I, so I do think you, Israel has a unique role. I do think that the church is grafted and the Gentiles grafted into one family, not two families. So I do think there's a uniqueness to it. And I think it's interesting that 1948 that happened. Uh, and, and I do think that wherever the end times are, we've been living in. And I think that somehow we're closer to re the, the God making all things new. Well, and honestly, it's when Jesus inaugurated this whole season, right? Jesus rising from the dead, everything shifted at that point. That's okay. a, that's the turning point. Yep. That's great. Okay, let's keep going. We have another question from yep. I I love it. You guys, this question is from Kelsey Yautzi. She is a fifth grader from Green Mountain Elementary, and fifth I gotta grade? tell you, this girl is fire. Okay. All right, let's hear from Kelsey. If the Battle of Armageddon started today, how what would it be like? Well, f first of all, I her and her family love. Great family. They're great people, and I'm a little bit intimidated. By the unicorn sweatshirt. I just think that is just the best thing I've ever seen. She's like, let me ask you about Armageddon wearing a pink <laughs> unicorn sweatshirt. Way to go, Kelsey. Wait, well, what, so Ar Armageddon, first of all, let's start this. It's a place. Like a physical place. Physical place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it's two words. And so the, the first part of the word, we, we, uh, it, it, it actually um, refers to a hill or a mountain. Okay. The second part of the word would actually, Megiddo, would refer to a fortified city. And uh, so for them, they actually have this place that would be on the road um, that would be between Egypt and then going through Israel to Syria. Yeah. And so northern Israel there, there would be a place there that you would call Armageddon. 
In fact, actually, I was there with a team of people, and one of our team members sent me a picture to remind me of what it was because we kind of like stood in this place where we're there at the fortified city looking over into the valley of Armageddon. And do, I don't know if they have a picture they somewhere. Do, yeah. It's just like it, a vast, vast field. So when I look at that vast field, okay, so it reminded me of a movie that Carrie loves. It's uh, 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 Lord of the Rings or something. Okay, not only Carrie loves the Lord of the Rings, I love the Lord of the Rings. And I assume you're talking about The Return of the King, which is the third Lord of the Rings. And in that, there is a moment where there's a, the big battle for Middle Earth, the white city of Gondor, a giant field. And honestly, when I saw that picture, I was like, yeah, that's the same thing in my head. Well, I, I'm glad you, you really know your Thank movies. Thank you, J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah, that's good. It's brilliant work. You, you, you got that down. And, and, and my wife, there's that long battle scene. Yeah. And it's a fortified city. And they're looking. They see forever the, all of those armies of the world that are coming at them. Okay. The picture that they would have had is this, is where could the ultimate battlefield of battlefields be that the world could have a war? And in their mind, it's Arm Armageddon. Wow. Okay. So now the way it would work is, the way they saw it, it, it was for them a real place in the Middle East. And it would have been that the armies of the East are marching and coming together to that place where there's this battlefield. Now, here's where you think you got to recognize, okay? When you look at the bull, so we start with the, 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 the seals and we see these are the common evils. And then we, 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 we go from the seals to the trumpets. This is the shared suffering of, of humanity. And we have all, all the suffering that we face, both environmentally, but also physically. And then you move to the bulls. Mm -hmm. And with the bulls, what we see is this. There's a place there where we're actually brought into that beyond this environmental disaster that's happening. Which, by the way, I have a friend, businessman, he said, man, he's like, I'm not an environmentalist, but I'm glad there's some rules because we would destroy everything. And uh, it was interesting he said that. Uh, behind every part of this, this, this the bulls being um, this crescendo of evil, which is interesting is for them, remember, okay, the seals, that's what... what it's a physical thing, like a yeah. sealed envelope. Okay, and then the trumpets. Yeah, like the Hi, Wes, this is Izzy, and, and I have a few yeah, questions it's either for you. the call to war, call to worship. There you go. Okay? that the bulls would have been used for baptism. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? This is the baptism. All of this is to turn our hearts to God. This is not wow. God. God's wrath is not, how do I just crush you guys? It's how do I turn your hearts? And that after a death, there's a resurrection. Okay, and so what you see, there's a moment there in the bulls where you actually have a, a look into what's happening spiritually. And there's this battle that happens that is actually this, this, um, this, ultimate spiritual battle that's barbaric behind the scenes where we have the bear and the lion and the scorpion, right? Seriously. And for us, we look up at the sky and we see planets. And if you have like a, a telescope, oh. you can actually see them. Yeah. The way they looked at the sky was more the stars. And they would have looked up and saw what? All the constellations. The bear, the lion, the scorpions. Spiritual battle. And what they're saying is this. Behind all of the evils of this world, the wars that we have against each other, the destruction in this world, environmentally, but also socially and economically and in our families, there's a spiritual battle that's going on behind the scenes. That's the true battle that's happening that Jesus is going to defeat. Wow. And the Armageddon, to me, is the ultimate defeat of evil. Hmm. And what's interesting is you go there and you go like, okay, What's the sixth bowl? That's okay. That's that bowl of here's all this spiritual battle. What's the seventh bowl? Okay. So I, I, I had to look this up. So the seventh bowl, it says, then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a mighty shout came from the throne in the temple saying, it is finished. Did you know that? That's wild. Yeah. Okay. So who said it is finished? Jesus said that on the cross. On the cross. Yeah. Do you get this? This is like what Christ said on the cross is this, is that evil, death, and sin has been defeated, and it's played out then in history to where evil, sin, and death in the Armageddon are defeated. That's good news. Yeah. That's good news. Okay, we got to keep going. We got to keep okay. going. So question eight comes from Abby, and I love your heart, Abby. Here's what she writes. If God loves all, why are there unreached people groups who live without knowing of Jesus? Where will these people go when they die? Okay. Well, uh, jump into some specific things, okay, is the word Jesus means the Lord saves. So we are like, did they say Jesus? And I actually think God is just looking for hearts that are just saying, hey, God, save me. It's good. All right, the other is God is the best judge. It's good. So we're always, we're worried, will, will God be a good judge? A lot better than us. <laughs> I sure okay. hope so. <laughs> so who's, who's making it in? Okay, there's the ones who don't make it, Lake of Fire, right? 
those are, who make it, this new heavens, new earth, living in this new Jerusalem, okay? The ones who make it, their names are in what? The Lamb's Book of Life. Lamb's Book of Life. Okay, now we hear that and we're like, that is just so interesting. I've never heard of that. For them, they're like, yeah, every city that we know of has a Book of Life. Hmm. You're born as a citizen, your name is put into that city's Book of Life. So we get birth certificates, social security cards. They yeah. get their name in a book of book life. Book of life. Yeah. So he's just saying to them, you know how your name got in a book of life? Your name, your name, because you were born, right? Yeah. You just got reborn and your name is in heaven's book of life. How cool is that? That's beautiful. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Let's, let's keep going because you mentioned this a few times and I want to give a minute to it. Uh, Brennan asks, what is the new heavens and the new earth? Okay, well, I know Brennan. Yeah. And I, I actually think it's North Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> on a beautiful summer day. I think, I think the new heavens and new earth is the Shire. <laughs> <laughs> but, that, but that's a nerdy answer. It's a great answer. Um, so, uh, okay. So I used to think the new heavens and the new earth were somewhere else. Hmm. So I would say this is earth. And you go like, well, what's above us? Okay. We might say the sky. They might've said the heavens. Hmm. We're like, well, what's above the sky? We might say what? The atmosphere. They, they might have said the second, second heaven. heaven. There you go. And I even knew a guy who went up into the third heaven. Okay, right. Do you know what I'm saying? He's talking about We're Paul. trying to <laughs> figure out how to talk about the universe with words that we may or may not have at the time. It's good. Okay. When Jesus talked about the kingdom of heaven, he didn't say it was like, you know where like space is? It's beyond that. He didn't say it's like the seventh heaven. Well, they would have talked about that. That would have been a thing you would say. He said the kingdom of God is where? It's at hand. So when you put your hand out in front of you, he's saying it's that close. Hmm. What he's saying is there's a realm in which God rules and reigns that's right in front of us that's been disconnected from this world that in the new heavens and new earth, the reality of that comes back. And so even in Jesus' ascension, we kind of did he float upward. He was just gone. Hmm. Because why? That dimension's been lost. Wow. And well, so, yeah, at one point they were like, why are you staring into the heavens? That's what the angel said. Yeah, and maybe he did fly. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know how it looked. I just know this is heaven isn't something that's more distant than the end of the universe. God is imminent. He's close. His kingdom is right in front of our face and we're missing it. And so his, the new heavens and the new earth is this rejoined heaven and earth that got lost from the garden because mm -hmm. God used to, he lived with Adam and Eve and it's a fully remade universe. I actually think in the new heavens and the new earth, we have trees and pets and food and we're always worried. Like, I wonder if there's good stuff in heaven. Listen to me. The same God who made this creation is going to make a new creation, and I think it's going to be even more creative. I have a friend named Rosemary Kowalski. Shout out to Rosemary if you're watching. And she said, you know, Scripture says if the streets are paved with gold, and I always pictured that like, oh, there'll be so much gold. And she's like, no, gold is just pavement in heaven. Like, mm -hmm. I just think the idea that God can create something so beautiful, so beyond what Think we can about imagine. how you live, okay? The worst thing that can happen to you as a follower of Jesus is you spend eternity with God forever in a perfect world. Mm -hmm. <laughs> think about the courage that gives you to yeah. face the difficulties that we're going through and how it bonds us together to, to kind of like go through difficulty together to proclaim the message of the mm -hmm. cross. You know, we had an anonymous question on this topic. I want to make sure we touch it for just a moment. The question was, will we recognize our loved ones? Um, so uh, I'll just answer this. It's, this is my answer, okay? Uh, so I'm going to say yes. Uh, but in the way that, okay, the resurrected Jesus shows up to the disciples. Yeah. Did they recognize him? No, not really. I mean, well, yes, yes. The first ones on the road to Emmaus didn't, but then they did. The disciples did in the room. Yeah, showed up. So, so it wasn't like, no, it's not you. It was like, Oh, that's you. Right. Okay. And I think of it like when you're, okay, in heaven, a new heavens and a new earth, that actually, we are actually made new in a body and in, 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 in glorified in a way that, that honors God. So I think about like, even like a, a Tim Keller is a pastor who talks about marriage as a partnership with God. So like I would be partnering with God that Carrie one day would stand before God and dazzling dazzling and it's like do i recognize her yeah but she looks like i've always knew that's who she could be wow and that's why i think heaven is you see people in in like this is what they would look like fully living in the presence of god every day that's beautiful okay wes we're at number 10 oh gosh we're at number 10 but i'm not gonna let you off easy this is a three-part question <laughs> Uh, shout out to someone who's, uh, there's another anonymous, Joyce and Ruby. You all built this three-part question for Wes. Are you ready for it? Does the Bible give specific instructions on how Christians should live in the end times? 
a follow-up is how do Christians take a stand for their freedoms and should Christians fight back? Okay, well, so um, this isn't a hard question for me, but there is some complexity to it. So I do want to... Yeah, uh, take a minute. Take, okay, so okay, should Christians take a stand? Yes, that's the question. Well, okay. Should Christians fight back? So my answer to both those is yes, but the question's how. Okay. So Jesus did, I don't know, did Jesus fight? Did he, did he take a stand? I, I would say yes, well, but not in the way that Peter right. thought he should have. Right. Think about it. in the garden, Jesus, he was going to what? Fight evil with the cross, sacrificial love. So would we say, man, Jesus, he just didn't even like do anything about it. Not a good plan. Yeah. Peter reaches for a sword and he cuts off the ear of the servant of the, of the high priest. And Jesus says to Peter, put down your sword. Why? You can't fight spiritual battles with earthly weapons. And I'm concerned about us when we say Christians take their stand. I, what I hear people saying literally is, can we use earthly weapons to actually make a spiritual impact? And I'm going to say, no. Hmm. Now I understand this. You live in a nation. And, and say, like, every, everybody who lives in whatever nation you live in, if a nation has a, or you maybe have a job where, where whatever reason you're trying to keep law and order, so you, okay, is there a time where in my duty of job or um, it, it, as a person that's a citizen of this nation that I would respond in ways that the nation would want to respond? You could do that, but you're not doing that as a Christian. You might be doing that as an American or a police officer or whatever your role is, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the Christian response that we have, that's why the world we live in is complex. Because why? We're spiritual. So the battles that the church is doing is while a world is at war, a church is on its knees. Mm -hmm. While a world fights one another, destroys, deceived by a false prophet by beastly powers by oppressive powers by 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 a antichrist the church is faithful witnesses following jesus with with sacrificial love and courage in the midst of all of this evil with their testimony and the blood of the lamb hmm. and so that, that's the way that i want to fight that's beautiful and when we worship, I actually think that that's powerful. Hear this. If you use earthly weapons, you never win hearts. So you lose. You might win for a little while, but you're going to lose. The only way to long-term win is to win hearts. That's why the message of the cross is more powerful. That's why Rome's empire is over. But the kingdom of God continues. You know? Yeah, think I, about love, that. I love remembering that the seventh bowl is this, it is finished moment. Yeah. Like that work, we call on that. We call on the power of the cross. We call on the power of the grave that is empty. When, then that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you. So take your stand and fight, but make sure it's with the weapons of, of, that God has given us spiritually. Okay, I know I said 10 questions, Wes. That, that was 10th one. I know, but I have a bonus one. Oh, and I really think, I, I think this one gets to a great heart of really what's going on. We have a question from a college student. So we've got an elementary uh, student, a secondary student. Now we have a college student. This is Izzy Irel. She's a sophomore at Whitworth. Uh, and I want to make sure that you hear this question from Izzy. Hi, Wes. This is Izzy. And I had a few questions for your Revelation hot seat tonight. Uh, one of them is, how do we prepare for all of the trials and tribulations that Revelation says is coming our way? And in all of these times, how do we remain hopeful? How should we convey a sense of importance and witness to others about the things that are coming um, without sounding like crazy conspiracy theorists? And how should we balance preparing for the future with living in the present? Wow, I Izzy and her family are amazing people and in so I'm just, I love hearing questions from the next generation. I think it's important. Um, I think one is um, the more connected we are to Jesus and his mission, the more our life makes sense as followers of Jesus. That's good. So uh, I would say to, to Izzy and your generation uh, to, to not get distracted by all the issues that we have made in our world as adults, as we said, this is the main thing. The main thing is Jesus and the mission of God. That's good. And if you can do that, stay focused on that. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's, that's what's going to make the biggest impact. I noticed that you, you talked a little bit about conspiracy theories. Mm. And I, I'm not, I don't think I'm an edgy person, but I, I do think it's important to speak to some of this. Yeah, I think so too. Um, if somebody 
And I, I want to speak. I've, I heard somebody say this. I heard an adult say that they're disappointed in the younger generation. Hmm. What's interesting is by, by listening to some of the younger people who are following Jesus, I hear them being disappointed in some of the adults. Huh, how, why do you think that is? Well, because they're saying you're making it harder for us to share Jesus with our friends because of your crazy conspiracy theories. Hmm. And I'm not speaking to one side or the other. I'm just, what I mean by it is this. If you looked at everything you've written on Facebook in the last year or Instagram, or if somebody recorded the last three months of conversations you've had, would they think your primary message is Jesus, the grace of God, the power of the cross? Or would they be like confused by all the crazy things that you've been caught up in? And I'm telling you, we have a generation, I believe this, that the greatest move of God that we've ever seen in our lifetime is going to be led by the next wave of followers of Jesus. And what they need from people my age and older is to not be distracted, to have our eyes on Jesus, to be in prayer for them, and to make a way for the next wave to do things as God pours out his spirit on them. Hmm. And I want you to hear, if you're a young person here, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit speaking to you. You do not have to do church the way we've done it. You do not have to, to follow the ways that we've led it. Um, you do need to honor. You need to honor your, your mother and father. You need to honor the older generation. But we want you to know the older generation, if I can speak for some of them, <laughs> we believe, as Jesus says to disciples, you will do greater things because this world definitely needs it. Hmm. Hmm. I love the heart for the way we live now, that the way we view the last things, the way that we view what Jesus is trying to speak to us, what he's trying to reveal to us through the revelation, through all of scripture, it impacts the way that we live now. And I think that that's really the heartbeat that we're here undering some of these questions that this, this world is a little bit wild. I know personally for me, I have friends on all sides of some of the most polarizing issues. And I just keep trying to think, you know, what is the best way for me to keep my eyes on Jesus? What's the best way for me to be a good friend, to be a good wife, to be a good mother through a season like this? Because uh, it is difficult. I, I, I found myself about six months ago in not, not feeling good and distracted and caught up in all these conversations. And I had a moment where I felt like the Lord said to me, before you look at your phone, meet with me. Before you look at your messages, before you look at your email, your text messages, your, 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 your um, you know, social media stuff, yeah. meet with me. I started to meet with Jesus. And it started with, uh, uh, honestly, I, I, was, I, I think I was role-playing before God. And I had a moment where God was just like, stop. And I had a moment where I just said to God, I'm here. And when I said the word here, I felt his presence. Mm. And I felt like he said, I've been here the whole time. And so we, we started to design something that we call Jesus XP. It's an experience, Jesus experience, where we want to help every follower of Jesus be connected to Jesus every day and connect with a group of friends mm. or family members that want to be connected to Jesus and apprentice to him in real life. Hmm. We need that elite army, okay, that is on mission with Jesus in a world that is beastly. Yeah. Yeah, and it's hard. I get that. We need each other. So that's something I would love as a, 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 as a gift that we could give to everybody yeah. is how do we put in everybody's hands Jesus XP so they can do this experience. Okay, yeah. You know what you can do is if you're feeling like I need that and if you're like me and you're like, I actually think it would be really meaningful to sit down with some of my friends, even on all sides of issues and just talk about how Jesus is leading us to live out the mission in our real life. Go to newlife.tv slash Jesus XP. There's a, just a place where you can put in your email address and we'll make sure that you get all of the resources to be able to do that together with your friends. I think it'll be really meaningful. Uh, for me, it has been. I, I've been doing this with some friends. And, and there's one thing, one more thing I want to give people. Okay. Last thing is uh, I know that the book of Revelation, it's, it, again, it's hard work, mm-hmm. but it is, I think, obvious when you look at it through Jesus and the cross and the mission of God mm-hmm. and heaven coming here. Okay. But I do know a lot of people go, I didn't grow up in church. I don't know the old Testament. I don't know all these codes. Here's what we did. Okay. I sat down. I have three pages where I just wrote out, here's the code. Here's what it means. And it wasn't just my work. It's good. Okay. Like it's not okay. Basically pulled from about a couple thousand years of here's what Christians have felt. These things have meant 
through the majority of history as it relates to the codes and what they mean for the book of Revelation. Love to give it to everybody. Yeah, so if you actually like the Facebook page, the New Life Facebook page, if you're watching this uh, on the Facebook Live feed right now, you should just be able to click on the little newlife.tv, like the page. We'll make sure to post that code document there. I'll also put a link for Jesus XP so that you can make sure that you get signed up for that as well. I think it'll be a really, really meaningful thing for you. You know, Wes, uh, we did some good work tonight. Did some good work tonight. And I, I hope this, um, you know, one of the things Izzy said at the end, I, I really feel like is my heart for us. I think our heart, she said, how do we remain hopeful? Okay. And I think that's really what the, the heartbeat for yeah. this is live answers to tough questions from a pastor's heart. Yeah. And hey, if you're someone who is like, I have loved this time, one, you can still share this with your friends. We'll have an opportunity to do that. Another is this, we want to keep doing these hot seats. Mm -hmm. I think there are certain things that we just need a little bit more time for, a little bit more conversation. Uh, and actually, we want to hear what questions you have. So if there's a topic that you're like, I want to bring this to the hot seat, make a comment right now on this feed. I'm going to go look it up. I'll bring it to Wes and we'll see if we can schedule a future hot seat. All right. Hey, thanks for being here. I, you know, Wes, I thought it would be good for us to end this time. You know, we said that, how do we, how do we fight? That there are, there are earthly weapons, but that there's a spiritual battle. And we fight spiritual battles with spiritual weapons. So I thought it would be good for us to close together, just kind of uniting our hearts in prayer. Okay. Everybody who's watching this right now, wherever you are in this world, would you join in prayer together? And let's call on God. Father, Thank you for your love for us, that you want to make your home among us. <laughs> and in a world where there's death and dying and pain and sickness and plagues, and hardship, and suffering, you sent your son Jesus to take all of that on the cross and say it's finished. And with changed hearts, we join your army to spread a message of love, to turn hearts towards you until the day you come and make everything new again. God, would you plant hope in the heart of every believer? Would you get our, our attention, God, focused on you? And Lord, would you fill us with your power to be your hands and feet in this community, in this world, and where we live and in our homes? God, may every follower of yours hear your voice saying to them, come up here. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right. We'll see you next time on the hot seat.